It's basically just the same movie as A New Hope. Rey is a total Mary Sue. It doesn't bring anything new to Star Wars. There was a lens flare that one time. It's an empty and ultimately meaningless film. It preys in your nostalgia like the cold, exploitive mess that it is. Now you don't have to write any of that in the comments section before even watching the video. Okay, let's have a civil and substantive discussion now. Star Wars The Force Awakens is a 2015. Okay, is it me or does this feel weird like every time I do this, like every time I talk about what a Star Wars movie is, like there's someone out there going, please, Michael, tell me about this great star. Whoa. Oh, Film Studies with Michael is definitely coming back at some point in the future. Probably for Willow or Tron. Oh, man, I can do on the move. The Force Awakens was written by J.J. Abrams and Lawrence Kasdan. Though Michael Arndt, who wrote Toy Story 3, Little Miss Sunshine, and then the weirdest little film trivia I've seen in a while, A Walk in the Woods, and The Hunger Games Catching Fire, under the pseudonyms Rick Curb and Michael De Bruyne? I don't know how to say his made-up name. I want to talk about difficulty for a second, and not difficulty in the way that Leonardo DiCaprio had to eat a fish's tummy to win his Oscar. No. But how much a deck could be stacked against a single filmmaker when taking on a task as large as this? Especially when you consider that originally there weren't a lot of people happy about J.J. Abrams taking on the task of making this movie. If I may enumerate, J.J. had to overcome making a Star Wars film that lived up to our collective childhood dreams of someday seeing in Episode 7 after Return of the Jedi, 32.5 years later, which is ironic because Jedi's budget, and this is real, was in fact $32.5 million. It all makes sense, Kim Trails are real. Making a Star Wars film for two different groups of people. Those that grew up with the original trilogy only to get their dreams of a new Star Wars film dashed by the toilet fires known as the prequels, and those that grew up with the prequels and actually kinda like them who are wrong. Making a Star Wars film that introduces characters entirely new to 100% of the audience while somehow mixing in existing characters from the original trilogy in a way that doesn't pull us out of the movie. Making a Star Wars film that- Holy f did he stop to blast your bolt in midair. What was I talking about? That was the moment for me. So who talks first? You talk first? I talk first? Actually, that was the moment for me, but I'm talking about the way this movie opens. The blaster bolt and then Poe mouthing off to Kylo in a way that endears us to his character after a single minute of screen time, that's not easy. And that's what I mean that the level of craftsmanship on display for JJ is unequivocal. This was an impossible task and he made it look effortless. Let me put it this way. He made it look so effortless that just five months later, we're attempting to rip this movie apart like it's just any other popcorn schlock. But it isn't. This movie is a miracle. It should not exist. And yet, it does. Yeah, we can nitpick it, but why? Why not just do a round of here's every reason this movie is awesome in two minutes or less. Ray rules, Finn rules, Poe rules, Kylo rules, Han Solo does this to a guy. Oh, and they killed him and somehow we didn't riot because they earned that shit. They had a lightsaber fight without a second lightsaber in it. The Claymore lightsaber that everyone freaked out about in the first trailer totally ruled and was thematically apt for his character. You know, because he's not quite in control. Leia felt Han's death through the Force and 100% of the audience understood what was happening without ever saying a single word about it. Greg Goonberg, this guy, Maz Kanata, this shit right here, the Alec Guinness hackery, BB-8, 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 practical, 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 practical. I mean, how many home runs can a movie hit? Because if we're keeping score, Team JJ just beat the Yankees by like a thousand. But that's all service level, isn't it? You came to me for that deep tissue narrative massage. What's going on under the surface of this thing? Well, as it turns out, a whole lot. There's a lot of small details that I think are overlooked about the film, like how it is Poe that allows the good guys to even have a shot through murder because it is he who shoots Finn's friend, leading to the three-fingered blood salute, which in turn leads Finn to have a crisis of conscience and rescue him. Or that Rey is us, dreaming of one day being as cool as the Rebel Alliance stories she heard told in passing. She happened to come across a helmet and wear it like an adorable little kid. And this is the best! Or that Poe jettisons Finn from the aircraft to save him, which is why he wakes up attached to a parachute and a prayer. And yeah, I know that Poe says he didn't do it, but between you and me, he did it. 
And one of the things that I don't even know how to credit, but my gut is saying that this is all JJ, is casting your movie with chemistry like Boyega and Isaac have, and I instantly together, on the flight away from the Star Destroyer, you just believe these two to be long friends we've been watching on screen for years. But you've been watching them on screen for like three minutes. Oh hey, and there's the metaphor here because new characters are fighting through relics of Star Wars past they themselves in a relic of Star Wars past. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, there's another one. Sorry. It's like the melding of the old and the burp. It's like the melding of the old and the new. Or that Conja Club traveling with the Guavian Death Gang, the best kind of gang, is actually the cast of The Raid. Wasted in the movie, sure, but still awesome. Also, Han ran away and has been mixing it up with Death Gangs. That is hilarious. And Kylo, the strongest Force user we've ever seen, seems to function based solely on pain of both the emotional and physical variety. Clearly, he's the most conflicted Force user of all time, getting as angry as goddamn possible in an effort to keep himself at peak. Kylo, he is very much seduced by the light side, a phrase we'd not even heard before this film. By the grace of your training, I will not be seduced. We shall see. The First Order is terrified that he will be seduced by the light side, and frankly, so is he. He's like reverse Luke. To maintain this, he throws temper tantrums, conceals his humanity by obscuring his physical form, despite no physical abnormalities that would require him to do so. Except at the end when Ray's like, I think Ben is being pretty honest with his dad on the bridge and you can see it in his eyes. He kind of knows he has to kill Han and honestly, so does Han. Boom, instant pain recharge. Thank you. And then Chewie shoots him. Which if you look at what that blaster did to literally anyone else in the film, you know how bad that hit was. To keep himself even alive, he is constantly punching himself in the wound to keep his force abilities up enough to hold his intestines in. And he obviously wants to murder the shit out of Finn, mostly because he feels that Finn personally betrayed him which he reminds him of a lot. But he has no such feelings with Rey. At the beginning of their fight, he is actively blocking her, but not attacking. He really never does. He just kind of chases her away and ensures that he stays alive. I mean, he swings around her, but never really at her. You need a teacher. I could show you the ways of the force. And that's at the end of the fight. This is confirmation he ain't trying to kill her. And then they reverse. He actually drops the dark side angle completely, and if you watch closely, she picks that shit up. This is anger. This is hate. This is the dark side. Which is why in the grand scheme of things, that will be Rey's struggle over the next two movies. Wouldn't it be crazy if this new trilogy was about Rey and Kylo switching places? Wouldn't that be far enough away from the original trilogy to warrant this movie's apparent proximity to it? We think we understand the relationships of everything happening in this film, but maybe we don't. If the abandonment issues within Kylo created the dark side user that he is today, couldn't the same be said of Rey, who has identical parental abandonment issues, if not worse? Which brings us to what I think is the most important aspect of the movie, and I know I've glossed over a whole hell of a lot by doing this, but I'm going to spend the rest of the video on one thing relationships. The entire film is about relationships, or the lack thereof. There's something very odd going on in this movie as it pertains to romantic relationships. And by that I mean, literally not a single character is in one. Han and Leia split, Luke's alone, Rey's alone, Finn is the only one with a potential relationship on the horizon, and bonus points for allowing the audience to believe it could be either Rey or Poe, but for the whole movie, he's not even close to a romantic relationship. Maz? Not really. I mean, she's pining for Chewie, who is clearly not pining for her because he stays in the ship. Shit, even C-3PO and R2-D2 broke up, and 3PO wasn't exactly taking it super great. In the original trilogy, Luke did not come from a broken home. Owen and Beru were happily married. You know, until they were burned alive, but that was together, right? So... I mean, for the entire 136 minute runtime, this is the only Star Wars movie that contains absolutely zero romantic entanglements of any kind. And don't bring up the f people in the cantina there. It has no representation in this film. And I know everyone wants it, but Poe and Finn are a ways away from that. They shared a jacket. Let's not go all middle school here. No one is married, no one is dating, everyone is alone, and practically no one noticed because it isn't presented as dire in any way. It's just sort of the way things are at the time. So then the question is, why do that? 
because regardless of what damage you think the prequels did to Star Wars, Metachlorians, Jar Jar Binks, a tiny wiener kid accidentally climaxing the entire film, to me, the most inexcusable fault was equating the dark side of the Force with the quote-unquote weakness of falling in love. Stew on that for a moment. Anakin becomes the preeminent evil badass of the galaxy because he commits the sin of falling in love? That goes against everything that the original trilogy stood for. Only through their love and their sacrifices that came with it do our heroes succeed. And without speaking a single word of dialogue, I think J.J. was retconning that egregious and if I may disturbing assertion the prequels were making. It's called The Force Awakens for a reason. And if I can extrapolate, love and the Force are one and the same. Love is the good side. Hate is the bad side. And not to punch the prequels when they're dead, but all six movies absolutely connect hate to the dark side. Shit, the Emperor says the word hate in like every other sentence. The dark side has to be hate, and the light side has to be love. And if the light side of the Force is all but gone, insofar that it needs to be awakened, wouldn't you know it, the love went with it. That has weight. That has meaning to all of us because it gives us something to believe in again. The Force is supposed to be mysterious and magical, and I think J.J. built it into the fabric of his movie so he'd feel like we did when we were kids, when love and the Force were magical things. And sure, the Star Wars films are just a science fantasy series where people in robes bop each other on the heads with laser swords, but that's not the reason they resonate. They resonate because for so, so many of us, they were built into hugely impactful slices of our criminally short time on this planet. It reminds us of the time we spent with mom and dad on the couch watching the very first thing that ever excited us. It reminds us of brothers, sisters, cousins, and neighbors running around the backyard and pretending to be every character in the films. It reminds us that films can surprise you and create in you such feelings, feelings I carry with me in every moment of every day as an entertainer because I can look at Star Wars and say, this is why I do it. It sounds absolutely stupid to say it out loud, but the world is a better place measurably because Star Wars exists in it. I can't think of a single franchise that has been responsible for more joy being put out into the world than Star Wars. That ain't nothing. Regardless of what relationships are or are not happening in the film, the main relationship Star Wars has is to you anywhere in the world, really whether you want it to or not. Because something interesting occurred to me. Star Wars is Americana in the truest sense of this fake word that is inherently meaningless. Americana is our collection of artifacts as they relate to our history and the first three letters of artifact are A-R-T. And while I appreciate the cultural significance of Jackson Pollock as much as the next person, cinema, and by extension, Star Wars, are our main contribution to the world of art. Star Wars is so big it's almost incomprehensible. And yet, a designed and careful message from both J.J. Abrams and Chuck Wendig, as stewards of this franchise right now, was spelled out among the chaos happening in my country. Even though you may care about the color of someone's skin, their gender, or their sexual orientation, Star Wars don't. So nitpick the details as much as you want, endlessly debate about how you and your friends would improve this movie, because there's tons of room to do so. Just don't sell it short. This was a monumental achievement that truly has no equal, and not only that, it managed to say something important both to the audience and the universe of Star Wars at large. And while I must admit that the movie does adhere closely to A New Hope, I think many are missing the subtext there. Star Wars is not what it once was. Originally, Episode 4's subtitle carried with it no weight because what is hope without despair and having emerged on the other side of the prequels? Does this title only now carry with it the necessary weight? It might be called The Force Awakened, but as many have already pointed out, it's a new hope. Oh boy, that got heavy. Uh, thank you for watching. What is the end of the 2015 sci-fi triptych? That's why they all kind of have the same ending. I actually wasn't going to do that on Star Wars, and then when I was really in the meat uh, of my review, I realized that Star Wars means a lot, I think, to a lot of people, and I wanted to, to pay homage to that and pay respects to that because I think part of why cinema is even as big as it is owes a lot to Star Wars and George Lucas and where all that came from. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. I can't believe I got all three of these episodes and an episode of Hot Takes done in a single month, so I need a bit of a break, but... <laughs> 
Uh, I will be back to it shortly, hopefully. Uh, in the meantime, you guys can vote on the next episode. Let's throw up a Scott, a Nolan, and a Jennings. Ooh, curveball there at the end. Let me know which movie you'd like to see next in the comments, and I will see you guys next time. As always, please like, subscribe. Uh, I j it, it's, we're going through the motions now. If you're watching my show, please subscribe to my channel. I don't, I don't think I'm asking too much. It helps a lot. It's a big deal. So if you want more of the show, just hit that sub button. You don't ever have to check them. Just subscribe because that actually helps a lot even on the back end with how I relate to YouTube, the more subscribers I have. So share this, make something happen. I love you guys. See you next time.